today, today I'm going to talk to you about observation. How to see everything the first time. Uh, how to be better observers in this world that we exist in. Now, being an observer is sort of quintessential to everything that I love and do. As an anthropologist, my job is to be dropped into a tribe or culture other than my own, to observe them, to come to some understanding of who they are, what they're passionate about, what they think about. As a mentalist, I have to read people's thoughts. As a magician, I have to know how people observe things in order to fool them. As a corporate trainer and speaker, my job is to have fresh eyes within the organization and see things no one else sees. When I was little, I wanted to believe that magic was real. Who? That you could just blow a bubble, reach out and touch it. But as soon as I touched magic, it seemed to disappear. Same is true with some things that we observe in science. For example, if we look at an electron in an atom and we imagine and we observe it as if it's a wave, it's a wave. If we observe it as if it's a solid, then suddenly it's a solid. Isn't it strange that how we observe something as small and as real as an electron turns into what it becomes. What we believe is real is real. In Latin they say, Kratos quote hobbis et hobbis. Magicians try and fool us with the uh, what is real and not real game. One of the oldest uh, games in the magical book, the cup and ball. The cup and ball trick. It goes like this. Early versions were called the thimble rig game. Modern versions include three card money. Take the ball tossed in the cup. Ball tossed in the cup. Shake it up just like that. Ball, cup. Your job is to determine, whoop, your job is to determine if the ball is under the cup or if the ball is in my pocket. That is your job. Decide is the ball underneath that cup or is the ball in my pocket. Watch close. Not in the hand. Possibly in the pocket. Under the cup. What do you think? No, of course. It's in the pocket, right? No, under the cup. How does it get there? That's the question. Maybe if we observed closer, ah, fallibility to our observation. To talk about observation, I'm going to talk about observation in three ways. First, why we want to be great observers. Second, what our fallibilities are that make us bad observers, because we have to start with our flaws in order to overcome them. And third, what we can do to be great observers. Why would we want to be a great observer? Look at modern superheroes that are pulled from history. Sherlock Holmes, Batman, re-emerging from the Victorian time, from the 40s, coming back today in major motion pictures. These are superheroes that are great observers. They can see things other people can't see. If we are great observers, we become better business people because we're able to see the economy, see the stream of customers, see where our industry is going. We become better salespeople. We're able to look at our customers, know what it is they want to buy, know when the buying moment is, and be better salespeople. Become better lovers, become better friends, and have a higher quality of life as we soak in more of the universe around us and we experience more that this one life that we've been promised has to offer. The great authors uh, of Slights of Mind, um, Susanna martinez Condi and Stephen Macknick, I advised on that book, they write in Slights of Mind about what our ability to, our ability to observe really looks like. Hold out your arm like this. If you're in the audience, I'll try them like this. Look at your thumbnail. I can see you. Look at your thumbnail. Okay? That's how much you can actually see. Your thumbnail at a distance. Everywhere other than your thumbnail, you are legally blind. That little teeny spot is what you can see in focus as you move it around the room. Everywhere else in front of you, you are legally blind. Legally blind everywhere else. You think you see, I think I see, all of this. I believe it. There's even a spot right in front of me 
that I don't see at all. None of us do. Take a cardboard tube or your hand like this and the other in front, and you'll be able to see right through your own hand. There's a spot in front of our vision that we do not see that our eyes compile together and make guesses as to what is probably there, and that's what we see. When someone's driving down the street with their cell phone texting, and they say, well, I can see the rest of the road, I'm just looking here. Thumbnail. Thumbnail. Everywhere else you see, you are legally blind, and your brain is making guesses as to what is there. I recently asked a police officer friend of mine, which this is a terrible question to ask a police officer, what would you rather, uh, someone be driving drunk or someone be driving while texting? After the harsh stare of the police officer, the answer was someone driving drunk, because at least they're trying to see the road. They're trying, right? Texting while driving. Some friends will use MapQuest while trying to get from place to place. And even though there's an enormous sign for the restaurant they're going to that can be seen four blocks away, they'll sometimes miss the restaurant because MapQuest said it was over there. Sometimes we're not observing the world. We're just stuck in these blinders. But it's not our fault. We have built-in blinders. The spectrum of light we can see here. This light exists. This light exists. Other animals and insects can see it. We can't. Our ability to hear is here. There are sounds that we can't hear. Other animals can. We can't. There are scents that we can't smell, tastes we can't taste. They say that super tasters, when they taste cilantro, it tastes like soap. Luckily, I'm not a super taster. <laughs> I like cilantro. There are tastes that we don't experience. Our senses fool us. And the idea that we have to start with our fallibility. The idea that, well, if I see it, I'll believe it. If I'm there, it happened. Well, that has to go right out the door. In the musical, uh, actually, let's, let's step back for one second. Bring up the house lights just a little bit when you can. If you're wearing a watch, which few people do these days, cover it up. Don't look at it. Cover it up. If you have a smartphone, feel free to pull it out and cover it up for a second. Cover it up for a second. This is what I want you to do. Imagine your watch. Imagine your watch. Imagine what color your watch is. Don't look at it. What color your watch is. Um, do you have a second hand? Are all the numbers shown? Are they Roman numerals or actual numbers? Does it glow in the dark? Is the date set correctly on it right now? Don't look at it yet. You peeked. I saw you, cheater. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. Think about it. Imagine it. And now I want you to look at your watch and see how close you got. How many of you missed a part? How many of you didn't see every piece of it? Everyone with a watch is raising their hands like this. The fascinating thing about this is the purpose of a watch is to look at it. We look at it all the time. We look at it hundreds of times a week. We look at it. And yet we don't see it. We don't see it. We just see the part we need and we gloss over everything else. Selective vision. Ah, knowing that we select our vision makes us a better observer when we overcome it. As a child, my grandfather had a grocery store. And I can imagine walking through his grocery store and seeing every item in the grocery store. I can imagine walking up and picking up this can of soda, this can of soup, and exactly where it is. But I can't remember everything that I did yesterday. Why is this? As children, we have evolved or have been created to soak in everything. Because as a nomadic people, as a traveling nomadic people, if I'm in this region in the summertime and my grandpa shows me where the well is, and then we travel into the mountains in the wintertime, nomadic pastoralists, and grandpa dies before we come back in the summer, I have to remember where that well is to survive in order to have water. After the age of 30, our brains stop collecting all information, and instead we pattern match. We say the universe will be unchanged. Because the way great-great-grandpa hoed the field 
is the way great-great-grandpa hold the field, is the way grandpa hold the field, is the way dad hold the field, is the way I'll hold the field. And after the age of 30, we don't need to learn new things anymore. Uh-oh, fallible brain, right? And so we take the same route to work every single day. We take the same route to school every single day. We go to the same grocery store every day because it's comfortable. We're built to do that. It's not our fault. It's, it's how we're built. So we make assumptions about reality. We make assumptions about the way things are. So to start and be a better observer with three minutes left on the clock. To start to be a better observer. We begin with some knowledge that I learned as an early ethnographer. That's someone who, as an anthropologist, I'm dropped into a culture or society and I'm taught, watch these individuals closely. Watch them and become them. Learn how to be them. And, uh, and as we learned earlier with a little bit of magic, it's, uh, it's hard to always watch and see everything the first time. Oop. Two. Um, so how is it that as an ethnographer, my job is to go into a culture of a group of people I've never seen and be them and to understand them, participant observation? By being a child. I start by being a professional stranger and being a child. Everything I know is wrong, everything I do is wrong, everything that I have known in the past is wrong, everything that they do is right and real, and I accept it. The sponge turns on and I start to soak it in. They say in the first two weeks as an ethnographer, write down all the notes you can about this new society or a new job you go into or a new consulting job you go into. Write down as many notes as you can in the first two weeks. Why? Because after the first two weeks, everything becomes normal and natural, and we pattern match, and we don't see it as new anymore. First two weeks eating a chocolate-covered spider, really strange, right? First two weeks learning that your tribe is made up of cannibals who consume uh, the ashes of the dead, really strange. Six months in, everybody does that, right? It's normal. And so... We find that 90% of our notes come in the first two weeks, uh, and then we spend the next two years making sure that the notes we made in the first two weeks are accurate. Next piece is you want to change things in your life, so you start reprogramming. Take a different route to work. Move your trash can in your office. You will be amazed how often you throw a ball of trash to the wrong corner and have to pick it up. But do it because it makes the brain come aware and awake, choosing to be aware and awake. Walt Disney's Imagineers, when he ran it, they were the WED team, Walter Elias Disney team. They said Walt Disney would walk the grounds and you would see him every four days. You couldn't go four days without seeing him. Steve Wynn in Las Vegas walks the floor and all of his employees say he knows them by name. Doctors in hospitals, I consult with hospitals, they're supposed to do what's called rounding and walk the grounds. But sadly, most of the time, they're like a lion in the zoo that walks in circles going mad and no longer seeing anything new or fresh. And I try to teach them to actively round, to ask questions, to imagine this is your first time seeing something. The first time you see a crack on the floor, if you fix it, then it's fixed. A crack in the window, a mess in the carpet, you fix it. But if you let it go, then others start to appear and they gloss over like they're not seen, like the underwear in a lot of men's bedrooms everywhere. So I ask you to stay curious, to think like a child, and to try and see everything. For example, is there anyone in the room that I owe a candy bar to? Oh, interesting. One person here on the side. I'll give it to you, and one over there. Excellent. I don't know if the rest of you noticed, but on the table as you walked in, on the door as you walked in as well, and when they turn the lights you can see it, there's a big sign that says, Paul Draper owes you a candy bar. Feel free to look over there now. And oddly enough, none of us see it, because we gloss over the things that aren't important. So start observing, start seeing, I'll get you a candy bar. I'm Paul Draper. Thanks so much. Again.